Good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon, good afternoon. I am so pleased to be able to welcome you to the second in our series of Cape Caribbean Studies, Sociology and other kinds of workshops at the Cape level. I'm really pleased to see all of you. I see there are 37 of us online and pretty much my role as head of department in the Institute of Caribbean Studies is to welcome you and also to be able to hand over to those who will introduce you to those persons who will carry out the basic functions for today. I'm Sonia Stanley Nayo, and I am Director and Senior Lecturer in the Institute of Caribbean Studies. Most importantly, I have had so much experience with sociology. And of course, Dr. Orville Beckford, who is your presenter today, we go back a long, long way. Now, I don't wish to age myself, so I won't tell you how long, but we go back such a long way, and it is very much my pleasure to be able to have him host another in the series of workshops that we do as a service, as a service to the community of students across the Caribbean, because this is not just for Jamaicans. We're located in Jamaica, but this is not just for Jamaicans. We are providing a service that goes way beyond, in fact, those persons who are outside of the region who want to learn about Caribbean studies, who want to learn more about the sociology we are interested in in the Caribbean, they also tune in. The videos are then archived online for people to be able to see in future. But first, let me tell you a little bit about the Institute of Caribbean Studies. The Institute of Caribbean Studies is also home to the Reggae Studies Unit. We were established in 1987, so that's quite a while now. We are celebrating 33 years of existence. And pretty much, we are about, I would like to say, the coolest department at the University of the West Indies. We're the coolest department because we're studying some of the coolest things. So if you don't know, now is your chance to know that when you come to the UWI, you must check out the Institute of Caribbean Studies and the Reggae Studies Unit. We offer programs in music and performance studies in entertainment and cultural enterprise management, as well as cultural and creative industries. So there are BA programs for you at the undergraduate level. And suppose you're one of those ambitious students knowing fully well that you're going to move from the undergraduate level to the graduate level. Then we also offer graduate programs in cultural studies. And those are some of the more important of the things that people will engage in because you know, nowadays I like to tell students that because of this liberalized educational environment, a first degree doesn't any longer distinguish you. So you really want to set your sights on graduate work and a subject like sociology fits you well for doing graduate work. In fact, I'll tell you, my own foundation, part of my foundation is in sociology with a, with a focus on social psychology, something I'm quite proud of. I spent two years in the University of the West Indies at the Mona campus engaged in sociology. And if you don't know, you know, what kind of things you can use sociology to study, it is one of the most important foundations that you will get in things like theory, in research methods, in the ways of understanding group dynamics, in the ways of understanding society and social dynamics. And those things are crucial. You don't want to be a member of any society a citizen anywhere and not understand how that society works. So sociology is crucial. I really want to wish you well in this workshop and to tell you that we are pleased that you've joined us. We expect you to learn and grow out of this workshop. And I will now ask our colleagues who are here to do all kinds of nice and wonderful things throughout the workshop to introduce you to Dr. Orville Beckford, who is going to be your speaker today. And I call on Dr. Nicole Plummer, who is Associate Dean, Marketing and Research, Lecturer in the Institute of Caribbean Studies, 
to introduce Dr. Orville Beckford. Good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to hear and I'm very honored to introduce uh, Dr. Beckford. Dr. Beckford, affectionately known as Becky by so many of us, is a wonderful individual. He is uh, an excellent lecturer. I don't think you can pass through Dr. Becky's hands and not be 100% equipped in sociology. Now, Dr. Beckford has been a lecturer at the University of the West Indies for 22 years. Can you believe that he does not look it at all? Not only has he been a lecturer, one of the guiding lights of this university is Dr. Becky. He is known both within the university and without, and uh, his philanthropy, his uh, work Dr. Beckford shared message of sociology with undergraduate students, graduate students, and uh, certainly at the various CAPE workshops he has been honored to host. And in fact, Dr. Becky completed his PhD in cultural studies right here at the Institute of Caribbean Studies in 2015. He's a lecturer in Caribbean culture at the University of the West Indies. He has an MB and he also did his bachelor's degree in management studies. So here is a fully rounded individual, cultural studies, sociology, management studies, business administration. Now his teaching philosophy is one that can only do well by students. For him, multiculturalism has made it necessary to know and understand the cultural sensibilities and background of his students for effective teaching and learning. For Dr. Becky, one of his main objectives as a teacher is to develop students to their full potential by using appropriate teaching learning tools. One of the things that he embraces, and you see it when you watch him on television, is that different students have different learning styles. And he sees his role as an individual to reach out to students, respective of their learning styles, and to effect not just content acquisition, but changing behavior. He wants to see them employing their critical thinking skills and problem solving skills using the information that he has been blessed to pass on to them. What he wants to create is a hunger for knowledge. And, I, and this hunger for knowledge, I have no doubt, will create even more graduate students. Now, to become an effective student-centered teacher, what he has done in different phases of his teaching career is to continually improve his knowledge of the relevant subject areas, to improve his pedagogic process, to adjust emerging trends in teaching and learning, to enrich the learning process by introducing new teaching technology. So as you can imagine, online teaching has Dr. Becky just fired up. And finally, to prepare students for effective contribution to the development of themselves, their country and region. Dr. Becky believes that his effectiveness as a teacher will be measured by the quality of his graduates and their evaluation of his teaching and learning processes. In the end, he wants to create change making, change leading, individuals and so it is an honor to introduce a truly phenomenal teacher but I've been blessed to know him personally and I'm introducing you to a phenomenal person. Thank you Nicole and also thank you Dr. Stanley Nair. Well gentle people we are here we are here. I was wondering who Nicole was talking about but I think she keeps saying Becky so I see you with me. But thank you very much Nicole. I believe in student centeredness and you are all here to learn. Now the workshop is worthy if you participate, if you ask your question. I'm going to ask you a question, and I expect individuals to also answer. Now, this workshop, with the help of ICS, will be in two parts. Because this afternoon, a number of people were emailing me or WhatsApping me to say that start with the SBA, because that is critical now. So I'll do the SBA this afternoon. It will take the entire time. And then I will go through unit one early in January. Of course, agreeing that ICS would allow me to have that part sometime in January where I can then review unit one. Then later on in that semester, we can go on to unit two where we can have a unit two. Then we can have a review of unit two in terms of question, MCQ question and others that we'll answer. So I'm hoping that with the agreement of ICS, this afternoon we do SBA, the next time we'll do a unit one, a revision of unit one, 
then after that, we look at unit two. ICS, as they have mentioned, are very interesting place where you come and do your degree. There's never a boring moment here in ICS. Never, never a boring moment. As Dr. Stanley and I said, we do very cool stuff. So we are ready to go now. So I'm going to upload my PowerPoint and the SBA. It is available to the teachers. They can contact ICS for it. It is available to the teachers. And so you can tell your teacher, or if any teacher listening, you can contact ICS for the PowerPoint. You have a CAP syllabus that is so informational. It gives you a ton of information. Unfortunately, many people don't read the information. In addition to giving the syllabus for each, once you download a syllabus, you get the last couple years past paper and how the questions were answered, how the questions were expected to be answered. And they will also tell you about the SBA, what were the shortcomings of the students. They will itemize what these shortcomings were. It is important that you look at your syllabus. Of course, for the exam on in semester two, earlier this year, that wouldn't be in a syllabus yet, perhaps sometime next year, but they are given it the year before and so on. So it is important that when you read your syllabus, you read everything in it. And so I take out of the syllabus what they're expected of you and discuss what they're expected to do. I extracted things from the syllabus so you can know what is expected of the syllabus. So I guess I have it here. The school-based assessment is an integral part of student assessment. Of course, because of the COVID-19, the last time they gave more weight into the SBA and I said, serve students right. Some of them really fool around with the SBA and wasted time and didn't take it seriously. It ended up that during the ranking now of the course in the online offering that they gave more emphasis to the SBA. So I'm saying to you that you need to pay attention to your SBA. It's intended to assist students in acquiring certain knowledge, skills, and attitude that are associated with the subject. I am going to tell you what those knowledge and skills and attitudes are, especially because it's sociology, you must have a research attitude and you must have certain research skills and knowledge about research. And so you can get a good grade for your SBA. The activities for the school-based assessment are linked to the syllabus, which is why I have the syllabus and took these from it, are linked to the syllabus and should form part of the learning activities to enable the student to achieve the objective of the syllabus. So this is another way of testing you to what extent you know the syllabus. During the course of the subject, students obtain marks for the competence they develop and they tell you all of these things. So you can read these, but all of what I have here, I drew as is from the syllabus, from the CAPE social syllabus. And don't just depend on the teacher to tell you what to do. You also will know what to look at once you enter sixth form you enter part of the self-learning process. It's still telling about the school-based assessment that the escape subject and then answer the validity of the examination which candidate performance is reported. It makes significant and unique contribution to both development of relevant skills, as I said, with respect to research skills and rewarding the students for the development of those skills. When they see those skills being exhibited, of course, you get good grades. All of these that I have here came out of the syllabus. They spend some time, you know, because generally most of you jump into the course without knowing what's the course about. So you jump into the assessment of the SBA without knowing what is it exactly are they looking for? What is it I'm expected to do? What will give me a higher grade percentage? Exactly what are they expecting? They said teachers will mark this report according to the SBA assessment guideline and criteria set out in the syllabus. So you should know how you'd be assessed with the thing that you're handed in. So you can know if you're given a good mark, if you did a good attempt, didn't do so well based on what they're asking you to do. Students are required to conduct a research project. Notice emphasis on the research. Emphasis on the research. And we know we who mark them no, when you did not do a research, where you just get some things and write it up. So conduct a research project and submit a report between 1,300 and 1,500 words on an issue related to any social group or organization in the community. We are aware of COVID-19, so we would expect that in conducting the research, some of you could go online and get a monkey survey 
and you could use those monkey surveys. You could send them out to people um, who can access them in order for you to do the research. So you wouldn't have to go face somebody face to face and then put yourself at the risk of getting COVID-19. So students may choose to investigate any issue related to the following, family, church, or other religious groups, free school. And remember that um, church is not just Ancona kind of Baptist or so on. There are also other denomination, other religious bodies outside of the one that you think are mainstream Christianity. Uh, those are not the only one. And in sociology, I'm going to go into C. Wright Mill sociological imagination, where we are expected to have an anthropological sensibility. So we also accept other religious bodies and we don't treat them as if they are third cousins. Schools, colleges, and within this COVID-19, there are so many opportunities to do research in your own school where you can get the students' email, you can get their WhatsApp, and you can send them the questionnaire for them to fill out. Um, so schools, colleges, political groups, non-government organizations, youth groups, and sports clubs, they give you a wide variety of social groups so that you wouldn't have to leave your school community or your community around the school in order to gather information to do the research. The students will be assessed on the ability to, one, clearly define a problem and a research objective. I shouldn't be reading page three of your report before I know exactly what you're studying. From the first thing that I should know, I should see on the cover of the SBA, what is it that you're studying? I should be able to identify right there and then what are the variables. I should can pick up from it what are dependent, what are the independent variables. What is it exactly are you studying? And so you're looking at, for example, at this is just choosing one out of the air, impact of COVID-19 on the entertainment industry in my area, because we don't expect you to go to, out to Jamaica. If you're, if you're like me, I wasn't born and grown in Tivoli, but Tivoli is one of my areas. So I used to go Passa Passa. Now we have Wede Wede, but Wede Wede has taken a beat with COVID-19. I want to look at what is the impact of COVID-19. I could also look at what is the impact of COVID-19 on academic performance of students in the sixth form. That is also one that the information available in the school is available also at the overseas education office for a particular school. And so you can look at the impact. You may want to also find out from the school what were the passes in those subjects the year before. So you can have a comparison to see if COVID-19 has led to an increased performance, or we are seeing less performance. So you have to clearly define a problem and a research objective. Conduct a comprehensive literature review. I'll go into that in detail because so many people believe that literature review is literature copy. A literature review is just that, a review. So very often we forget the review part and it carries a disproportionate amount of grade more than any other areas for your SBA. So it's not something for you to treat lightly because they want to know, did this student carry out a research project? If you carry out a research, you want to look at what the literature has to say about that particular area. COVID-19 is an emerging area, but already, if you put in COVID-19 on Google, any of the journals, you see hundreds of articles on COVID-19. COVID-19 and academic performance, COVID-19 and work on depression, COVID-19 and everything. So therefore you are expected to conduct a literature review. You could decide whether you're gonna have a quantitative design or a qualitative design, design. And so it is important. I will spend some time on both of them because it is important. So many people, run to quantities because it's easy you know bah, 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 put in some figures and you finish qualitative you have to explain uh it draws you out it, it sucks you in and then spit you out but it is so much easier to do because sometimes you get so caught up in the quantitative that you don't do the required section that you are supposed to do to make that truly quantitative data the qualitative data we are asking you what you think 
we are asking you to ask the people what they think about the COVID-19. They're seeing that we have inequalities such as phenomenology. What is it? How do they see this COVID-19? That's the phenomenology, the itness. What is it? How do they view themselves, their family, their own community in battling COVID-19? That's the phenomenology. We are so, so that you can also include narrative. So you talk to Mr. Brown down the road and so you quote him in your research. Mr. Brown, who lives with his family, said that he was shocked to find out that COVID-19 can kill you. Because given that I live alone, and when I feel sick, who do I call? When I start to get the symptoms, who do I call? Do I call my doctor? And so he expressed this, this foreboding about the COVID-19. You give the narrative. Narrative gives you a deep, deep description. It gives you a very thick description, to quote Ebich. Very, very thick description. And so it's important for you to, so you can think of quantitative or qualitative. A lot of you gravitate towards quantitative and we get such lighter treatment and the discussion. With the qualitative, generally we get very good discussion. For those who choose to do a qualitative study, we get a very good discussion. So you are to then use the, the appropriate research methods. They are present clear, accurate data, analyze appropriate techniques to analyze the data for the quantitative. There are some very simple ones at this level. For example, you could use pie chart, bar chart, uh, um, you could use frequency tables and so on. Discuss findings and draw reasoned conclusion. What we don't get sometimes is a proper discussion of the findings. The findings and produce a well-written report. Present the report in appropriate format. So a well-written report would also be would also be properly referenced. So you use an APA reference or an MLA, your teacher will tell you which one is appropriate. And APA and, and MLA is easier if you have a choice, much, much easier than the APA. But sociology tend to have an APA. So they would have indicated to the teacher. And you present the report in the appropriate format. Who can explain to me what I said about literature review? And what are some of the, the, the pitfalls with the literature review? Dr. Becky, Valerie Patrick asked, would you recommend a mixed method approach? It depends. I would recommend if I know what she's studying. There are some research questions that lend themselves to a mixed method. But I would want to ask her, why would you be complicating the issue? There's not wrong with a mixed method, don't get me wrong. But here you are doing both a qualitative and a quantitative research. There's nothing wrong with that except that you have twice to work because you have to do the quantitative part and the qualitative part for the mixed method. Whereas at this level, at the CAPE level, we we'll take one or the other, either a quantitative or a qualitative. But if you think you have the, the ability to do a mixed method of both quantitative and qualitative, fine. I'm just saying careful or you spread yourself out because it means then when other people are dealing with just a single research design of quantitative or qualitative, you are dealing with a mixed method. So you have to explain why qualitative, why quantitative, and why a mixed method, why you believe this is the best method of research in the topic that you're doing. Yugo Nando. I got it right? Yugo Nando Williams? Good afternoon, Dr. Beckford and others. Yes. I've always wondered if it is really serious as to the ordering of the literature review. Should information be strictly from the most recent to the earlier one or from the earlier to the most current? Thank you for that question, William. You start with the most recent. The most recent will be most telling. But you would later on point out that there were previous studies done by Williams and Brown, Brown and Michaela, by Henry and Dad and so on. So you would really start with the most current. So for yes, example, sir. again, if you are doing COVID-19, COVID-19 started 2019 and into 2020. Most of them are 2020 literature, journal articles. I don't think I've seen a book. Yeah, book has been out. Yeah, a couple books have been out, but you have access to journal articles and these will be 2020. Now, it is important, just following up on your question, William, that student knows that when you go to the literature review, you will necessarily find a literature link in the two variables that you have. You may find some link in one, some link in another. 
not because you won't necessarily find a journal article or a book linking both variables. It doesn't mean that they are not good literatures because sometimes you may not find for your research question an article linking both research questions. But what happens is that you find some link in one, some link in another variable. And so you are to do the assimilation of putting them together with respect to your research. Any other question in the chat, madam? Yes, someone asked how many sources are required in the literature uh, review section? As far as I can remember, you need at least six sources, which would include journal article, books, we don't consider newspaper an academic source because what you get from a newspaper is sometimes mainly just opinion. But there are newspaper articles in the case of COVID-19. How we learned about COVID-19 was through the newspaper. So um, if you're doing COVID-19 and you drew an article or two from the newspaper, especially if they are informational from the Ministry of Health, not someone's opinion, but because we got a lot of information on COVID-19 from the newspaper, from the Ministry of Health, from WHO, World, World Health Organization, and PAHO. And so um, those appeared in the Gleaner. That would be still a source. So we would mark it on for using that as a source from the newspaper. But normally, we don't recommend newspaper because they are just people's opinion that are not checked for facts and are not checked for academic uh, rigor. And so, um, so which is why we don't use newspaper. But where you are, you are using information in the newspaper. They are they, they send an article from PAHO or from WHO about COVID-19. Fine, that will be fine. So I'm going into the structure of the project. So you'd have the background definition. I'll go into them, the aims and objective. Shall review, noted literature review, eight marks. What is the difference between quantitative and qualitative data approach? Quantitative data approach is just that, quantitative. So for example, anybody can do a quantitative data approach. You can get information. Once you have enough samples and you run the research, then you can say, okay, this happened here where it showed that majority of the students who had online learning performed better on their um, sociology than those that were taught face-to-face. -face. So you are concluding that online learning results in a better academic performance. It was done quantitatively, you use 30 or more subjects. For quantitative, you need between 25 and 30. There's no hard and fast rule, but if you're using SPSS, which we use statistical analysis, if the quantitative is under 25, it won't take it. It won't take it, believe it or not. And so for quantitative, we say about 25 or 30 uh, in terms of responding for your questionnaire. So you then now can say with, with the quantitative that across the Caribbean, you can extrapolate that where social was offered online, you expect to see this type of result, that the online students perform better than the students who had it face to face. That's quantitative. Can, you can extend it, it's extendable to others, because it's quantitative. And so because it is quantitative, there's a level of reliability and validity because it's quantitative. Now for your qualitative, we keep saying for qualitative, the researcher must know what he or she is about. Quantitative, you can have a knowledge, but you don't have to be deeply embedded in the knowledge. For qualitative research, you have to know about the research. You have to know what are the things you'd expect because you have to know to ask appropriate questions. Yes, you ask appropriate questions for your questionnaire for quantitative, but the questions are more detailed for qualitative, because you want to know a very thick description of the topic itself. What about the online why students perform better? So you're going to ask the student, when you went to the exam and you're in the online, how you felt? Do you felt more nervous? When you're finished, how did you feel about the paper? And tell me some of the things that crossed your mind. You can compare this to when you did O-level last year and so on. So tell me, the, what are the feelings you got in your stomach? Did you have butterflies that you know to share for path? Did you feel good because you could pick the right answer, the answers on the paper, you could choose the right answer? Tell me exactly how you feel. This is quantitative, the qualitative, where you are giving us now deep insight into how the students feel about the online as opposed to the face-to-face. -face. We need a rational for the study. And the rational for the study can be because you just decide to study. That's, that's, that's not a good rational. That's not a good rationale. A rationale for the study would tell me 
that we are in COVID-19 and you see our, our country grappling with COVID-19. You look and see the state, the United States of America, the big United States, grappling with COVID-19. And so you think that a rationale for this study is to help the government make more informed decisions through the Ministry of Education about COVID-19 and its impact on students. So you are given a rationale for the study. Why I'm studying what I'm studying. And it can't be only because you like this. No. You have to give a rationale as to why you are studying what you are studying. I explain it quite quantitative and qualitative. Now, the definition of research problem, again, wrapped up with because the rationale comes from that. The researcher must discover and define a specific topic problem from a broad and general problem area. So the problem area is COVID-19. You want to define a specific topic, COVID-19 and students' ac academic performance at the sixth form level in St. Catherine or at Elsam High School or at Calabar High School or, or at Codrington College in Barbados or at the Maclet Conception High School or at Kingston College High School. That's the Kingston College already. That's my school, so I probably say it twice. Yes. So you're drawing a specific topic now from a general topic. The general problem here is grappling with COVID-19 and how it has affected education, health, work, transport, every single solitary thing has been affected by COVID-19. And so you're picking out a specific area of COVID-19 and students' academic performance. So you are, you are narrowing down the, the problem to a specific area. So you are saying, is there a correlation between the COVID-19 pandemic and students' academic performance and so on? Then the, uh, this specific topic is a research problem. It should ask about a relationship between or among two or more variables. You could also look at the issue of which is the one people get so wrong. People think that dancehall, the genre of dancehall music causes violence. Is there a correlation between dancehall music and violence? And I can tell you that most of 99% of the time, there's none. But we just think that because it's dancehall. Art imitate life. So the youth, them who sing in the dancehall, sing about what they see every day in their community. Because they sing about it, we wish they would shut up and don't think about it. So we say, they are the one causing violence. No, they are thinking about the violence that they see every single Saturday day. Art imitate life. So they are thinking about what they see. So we could, we would want to find out if there's a correlation between a um, level of dance or music listen to and a person's propensity to commit violence. It should be clearly unambiguously stated, precise and concise. It should be stated as a question or as a statement. So as a question, is there a correlation between one to commit violence and the amount of dance and music. It can be said as a question or as a statement, indicating a primary objective. You can also put it in the manner of an hypothesis. There is a correlation between dance and music and violence. That's a non-directional hypothesis. Non-directional hypothesis mean that you have indicated which way you expect the research to go. And it's all better that way. You are saying, is there a correlation between violence and dance? Art? But if you say that there is a correlation, that's a directional one, because you are saying that there is one. But you could question whether there is a correlation. And if you say there's not a correlation, that's also directional, because you are indicating the direction in which it is going. So don't get me wrong now. The directional one is when you say what you expect, that there is a correlation between dance and music and the propensity to commit violence. If your question is there, then it's non-directional. It should be testable by empirical method. It should be possible to collect data to answer the question. Here, the data can be quantitative empirical data, or you can do qualitative data. What's the difference between how you collect the two? For quantitative data, I said you require about 25 samples taken from a population. For qualitative, five people can be enough. Believe you me, five people can be enough for a qualitative data analysis, because you could use a focus group, a focus group within the school of five people, but you have to ensure that you'd have a type of sample frame that would involve a large cross-section of the people within the school. So, all right. So, pertaining to what you just said, sir, I understand that the quantitative one have to do by yourself. When you're doing research, you have to do it by yourself within 25 or more. 
right? The qualitative now, you said it has to be at least five persons, and you said sample frame. When you say sample frame, sir, what do you mean? All and right. the next thing again, sir, while those five people are doing research, does it mean that the information that is gathered by those five people, it has to be accurate enough so to complete the, the rest of the SBA? Yes, because it's not research done by the five people now. The information done on the five people, because uh, your group can have as little as five people that you're doing the research on. Whereas I say for the quantitative, for your respondents who answer your questionnaire, you must have at least 25. And depending on the topic that you're studying, some require you to have a control group and an experimental group. With the control group, they are being subjected to the normal things. With this one, you are subjecting them to something in particular and you want to know what's the result of what you are subjecting them to. That's when you have a control group and an experimental group. But most of you, like at this level, just have one group. You just have an experimental group. But if you're dealing with things to do with health and whether COVID-19 affects people with underlying conditions, you may want to have some people without underlying conditions or some people in a section of the population that is there and COVID-19 doesn't affect them as much as it affects those. Your experimental group where you pick people that have underlying conditions. Identify a question within the problem area which requires an answer. A need which requires a resolution or a gap in knowledge or a need to know more about a subject. Because sometimes your experiment can be exploratory where you are exploring does COVID-19 protocol result in teacher frustration and depression? You're not saying it exists. You're exploring whether these two variables produce a result that you can know do as a quantitative research or the qualitative research. Lana wants to know if the project can be conducted by five SBA students. I believe she's trying to figure out if... Every student must submit one SBA or can five students group up and submit one SBA? As far as I know, it's an individual work, but you can ask your teacher to find out from the CXC office if this is possible. I know it's an individual work that will be marked individually, and so I'm not sure about that one. But I'm, I would say ask your teacher to check with the, over, with the CXC office or the representative in your country or your parish, and you can find out. But on this one, I can't answer definitively. Dr. Ake, I was wondering if the young man had gotten the difference clearly with the qualitative and the quantitative. And I was saying as a person from the trenches, classroom teacher, we normally summarize them simply by reminding them that one is numerically or statistically based as against the one that is narrative or descriptive based. And they usually yeah, they tend to grasp it readily. Yeah, but the reason I haven't done so because I have it here, you know, to, um, to go into qualitative and quantitative and what is it that is part of them, I have it here. So which is why I didn't summarize yet. But thank you very much. Does the syllabus have a rubric for qualitative? The syllabus, as far as I know, it doesn't give you a rubric for qualitative and quantitative because this is expected to come out in the teaching process. But of course, it gives you a guide. It does give you a rubric, as far as I know. And I have a syllabus right here in front of me. I don't remember seeing a rubric in it for qualitative, but what they did, they spent a long time explaining to you what is the qualitative and quantitative and what they're expected to do. For the sociological perspective, is it that we are explaining how any theory contacts with our topic slash social issue? The arts in this card, this is more qualitative, but the ask specifically in your SBA, because in the qualitative, we call it grounded theory. But here they're asking whether well, it's quantitative or qualitative you are doing, how does this link to a one of the sociological theory? In my roundup, I already sent the PowerPoint to ICS. In my revision for unit one, I've gone into all the theoretical perspective that you're expected to do in terms of functionalism, Marxist conflict, interactionism, feminism, and so on. And so what they want you to do is to say which one of them would apply to your work that you're doing here for the SBA, which one of them, which one of the theories, and you have to explain why. Because what they want to do is to distinguish you doing a sociological SBA different from other SBA. Because if you're doing a sociological SBA, we expect that you would draw on sociological theories. So whether it is 
quantitative or qualitative you are doing, you'll be expected to draw on sociological theory. So when you come to university, it depends on your methodology, because we would ask for you to do a theoretical framework, whether quantitative or qualitative. What is it that frames what you're doing? Which theory would you draw on to explain what you're doing quantitatively? And so qualitatively too, we have grounded theory. Which theory ground your work? Which theory do you draw on? Which theory you think is the groundation for your work in terms of the two variables that you're looking at and the concepts that you're looking at? Thanks, Valerie. Patrick says that they're a teacher and they were just clarifying that a group can have up to five students where one submitted and each five get the same mark. One SBA submitted and each five. Each, each person gets the same mark. Is, is Valerie a teacher? That's what Valerie said. Yeah, Valerie Patrick is said that a teacher. But I would just recommend that you just double check. I, I as would well. recommend that, yeah. yeah. That, that mm -hmm. before you go that route, check with your teacher and let your teacher check with CSEC, just to be on the safe side. So we said we should ask about a relationship between among two or more variables. It should be clear. We are telling this already. And so we said things like topic, school, and so on. So I'll give an example here. Is there a correlation between family arrangement and student education performance at the CSEC level at Eltham High School? I'm on the board of Eltham High School, so I've been declared that. So your family using Eltham, and I went to KC, so I'll use KC. So in terms of a topic, is there a correlation? So you're asking if a relationship exists between family arrangement and student educational and performance at the CSEC level at Eltham High School. In the object of the study, answer the question about what you're doing. These set out what you hope to achieve at the end of the project. Objective, how are you doing it? Objective specifically should be a specific statement about uh, that define measurable outcomes. Is there a relationship? So how are you going to measure the relationship? Of course, your, your questionnaire is your instrument of measure. How are you going to measure your relationship and what statistical analysis are you going to use if you're doing quantitative? How will you go about achieving the desired outcome? All right, I have here for your literature review, which people had jumped to earlier. This is really a review of literatures associated with your research. Literatures associated with your research. And what is important in the literature review is for you to do the re 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 review. Not to just come and tell me that Brown said so, William said so, Taylor said so, Brown and Beckford said so and so. So where is the review? And if you are in doubt of what a review is, you can go into Harvard Business School and you can click on literature review they will tell you what it is and give examples of literature review. I went into North Carolina University at Chapel Hill, and on any of them, you can go on to Purdue University, where you get the APR, MLA, and you can put in literature review, and they will tell you. And what is that? The crux of the review is you are expected to review the literature to see if there are linked between certain literature and your research, if they are linked between literature themselves, which provide a better understanding for your research, if they highlight you to some data collection analysis that you weren't aware of, if they point you to some conceptualization that you weren't aware of, if they point to operationalization that you're not aware of. Conceptualization is when it tells about the main concept. So if you're talking about COVID-19, what the difference is COVID-19 and its impact on academic performance? What do you mean by academic performance? As measured by an external examination, where you get so many subjects as a kid, how do you measure academic performance? That's what you call conceptualization. Operationalization is when you put the data in a form that it can be measured. So once you say operationalizing, we're talking about measuring the data. So your operationalizing of your research will be how do you measure the research? So how you put research in a form that your two variables can be measured. So how you have COVID-19 that you can measure the level of COVID-19 you have as measured by what? Symptoms, sign, level of hospitalization, two days, three days, how? Academic performance as measured by how many subjects you achieve with at least a level three in CSEC or in CAPE, as the case may be. You have to define your concepts clearly. When I read your research late at night, before I go to bed in the truck in the morning, 
I know exactly what you're talking about because I don't have the phone can call you. I don't even know you. So for example, issues like teenage pregnancy and where there are correlation between family arrangement and teenage pregnancy. Teenagers in what? 12 to 15. Something we say 12 to 18. Some say 13 to 18. Some say 12 to 19. Some say 16 to 18. How? I need to know how you are defining teenager. Who is a teenager that I can attach a pregnancy to, a female teenager? So it is important. So this involves, I'm back into literature review. This involves review of prior work done in the particular area of interest. This body of previous work is referred to as the literature. So when you read a journal article, that's a literature. When you read a book, that's a literature. So for example, you have two sexy, very good textbooks. This is the one by Jennifer Mohammed, excellent text. This is also the one by Chinapu and others, excellent text. And both of them are very good cave social text, both of them. You don't need to buy both, one or the other will do, but they are two excellent texts in terms of cave sociology. So those can also be used as part of your literature review because you are doing issues of gender and so on. All the things are in the text. So therefore, that could also serve both of them as a literature. What relationship have been identified between variables and in previous studies? Findings and conclusion of prior work. Only relevant, reputable sources should be cited. No opinionated authority in newspaper are unsubstantiated sources. The function of literature review. Meaning of and relationship between variables that are chosen for the study. So you choose the two variables. You choose dancehall music, or you could choose soca music and violence at soca music and early pregnancy. It depends on what you choose. A basis for refining the context of the problem. Because as you read literature, you may want to refine the problem itself because new information is coming to light new understanding of the variables is coming to light, so you may want to refine the basis of the problem. A base for examining significance of the study. So you are given a rationale for the study, but these literature that you are now reading are given even greater significance to you studying it. How important it is, when you read those literature, you add even greater importance. A basic of determining possible Redundancies regarding the study in mind. When you say redundancies, you keep saying the same thing over and over. Or you keep referencing the same thing over and over. I'm saying if you reference it once, you don't need to do it again in terms of a literature. You may refer to it when you're doing your discussion. It gauges the feasibility of pursuing the topic, whether this makes sense. But not because you're not finding much on it, means it does make sense. Uh, it just means you need to perhaps search harder or ask the school if they have access to certain, to certain journal articles, certain websites where you can access a lot of different journal articles. Provide you with new ideas and approaches to handle methodological and design issues. So you look at what is methodology used in this article that I'm looking at. Could I use, oh, they use a qualitative, you know, never thought of looking at a qualitative research in this way. Oh, and this is what they did, or it could be quantitative, Oh, they use a chi-square and not understand a chi-square, but when they said that they use an hypothesis of following what the O. So it gives an idea of methodologies and also to how you design whether quantitative or qualitative. Reveal sources of data you may not have known existed. So you are looking just at a quarter of students at certain level, but the research here shows that the issue is much wider than the school. You want to include people of different ethnic groups. So you're doing it on just Afro-Caribbean. You can do it on Indo-Caribbean. And you can do it on other ethnicity within your area or within the school. Help you interpret and make sense of your findings. Yes. And the last part, reviewing or critiquing previous work in order to describe theoretical construct that they use and explain the phenomenon in which you are interested. Show all your work will be a logical extension of previous efforts. I'm going to pause here for questions pertaining to literature review. Okay, Rowan asked, how does the literature add significance to your study? Because the literature itself, one, it would have been for you to have it in a journal, it would have been a peer-reviewed literature, 
mean that there are other people look at it, this is okay to be published. So it would give you more references, would also look at issues related to one area, but are both, or some of which you never saw necessary. So it gives you that additional information that you may not know that have existed. Emma asks, where should these definitions of terms or conceptualization be in the IA, in the literature review? Some people conceptualize, but some people move on to rational, and then before the literature review, they give a conceptualization. I've also seen a process in which conceptualization come before your methodology. Uh, it is part of your methodology. For nurses, it is in the methodology that they conceptualize and also operationalize, and then they go on to the research design then sample design and so on. So it depends. When they give the rubric for the research, I think it's in the first part, but you can double check. How do you know that you've done a good literature review? One, you have referenced at least six literature, and most of them, are, are, if not all, are peer-reviewed literature. Most of the time, books before they are published are also peer-reviewed. So you call one to three, four. Also, what have I done with each other literature? Did I just go ahead and say that um, Brown and Williams said so-and-so and and finish? Or I reviewed what Brown and Williams said about COVID-19 and its impact on school. Did I hear my review in the literature? Because if you're not hearing your review, you have not done a review. You have done a literature copy. You just copy out what the literature said and you finish. I must hear a review. Did I review the literature? And did I make connection between this literature and my research? Did it help me to refine my research question? So these are some of the questions you're going to ask yourself when it comes to the literature review. Krista Stewart, I was asking about sociological perspective. It's a bit long, so I'm just going to invite her to turn on her mic and just ask her questions. I was wondering if it is better to use constructivism or pragmatism worldview for my research because personally I am using the pragmatism worldview which is basically that I'm doing my topic to see how the actions affect people but from what I'm hearing it's that we are trying to put it with a theory per se I don't know if I'm just picking it up wrong so one I don't know what your study is to tell you whether a constructivist one is where you give people the culture for them to get more meaning from it that's what I mean by constructivist well, because we get better meaning from things that we understand. So if I talk to you in your language about something in your country, you are better able to follow me than if I talk about something in Sweden. So constructivists provide the construction of meaning related to your culture. Pragmatism is just that. It's pragmatic. Given what we have, there are a number of things we do in COVID-19 is out of pragmatism. It is what it is. And so we can't do the normal thing that we we'll do so we, this is the only practical thing that we can do. For example, the government would love to keep the dance hall them going on at night time. I used to go ready with it up until when it closed down, until 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, I would carry my students to ready with it. Um, Dr. Stanley and I would carry her students to ready with it. And we stayed until 5 in the morning. But it is just not practical and pragmatic for ready with it to keep until 5 in the morning. The curfew is 10 o'clock. So it depends on the research, you choose that perspective. But my topic is the rise in the divorce in Jamaica. So that's why I was wondering if I should go more on a pragmatic worldview because I'm looking at the issues that that children may face. So you're looking at the impact of marriage on students, what? Depression, academic performance? let Let me put it down. I'm looking at the psychosocial and academic difficulties for children. So then you're looking at marriage and the psychosocial impact on students, because that should include others. You want to look at the impact for it to cover two, three, four things, because that way you just have two variables. But if you begin to separate the variables, so you're looking at the impact of marriage and academic performance, you're looking at the impact of marriage and psychosocial, that's three variables. That's a multivariate analysis. So if you start with three variables, you must carry through all three variables. So it's best that you look at this the psychosocial impact on students, marriage, and divorce. And of course, you may want to just go to divorce, because marriage is long and large. And oh so yeah, I'm focusing more on divorce because of the right. rise in Jamaica, yeah. Right, because if you look at marriage and divorce, then you have two independent variables, 
and then the rest of the dependent variable psychosocial is your correlation between level of divorce and level of impact on students. Any other question? Yes, someone asked what if the newspaper article is written by someone in the field? I think they mean like would it count in a literature review? As I said that if the article is written by a source that is academic and tried and proved, a person who is, has a good reputation in the field as someone who's an expert in the field, fine, fine. Other than that, newspaper articles are just people giving their opinion. So, of course, I've read a search for literature, a library book, official statistics, like the Survey of Living Conditions in Jamaica from Statin, Scientific Research Report, Government Publication, World Wide Web, and other reputable sources. So, your research design, a plan outline how the information will be collected, the method of data collection, whether you're using a focus group where you gather information, narrative, whether you issue questionnaires, which is a form of survey that you use to get to the sort of 40 people who is in your research. Such as for finding out something, a precise determination of what you want to find out. So how am I going to get information on margins? The detailed specification of the most appropriate and effective way of doing it. How do I get this information? How do I hear people are divorced, what they have to say if I'm being qualitative? Do I get a focus group? Will people really come and sit with other people and tell what led to their divorce? Will people be honest with me about their divorce as to what caused it? Will they be objective and say it was their fault? Issues that those are things you have to think about. So we have your factors determining the design, whether it's exploratory, descriptive, or explanatory. The intended use of research, basic applied. Applied research is when you're looking at something very practical that is going on. Applied research as opposed to just a general research. Because you can do research as to why people standing off a tree rather than taking tracks and going to them yards. But an applied research is you're in an applied area. And so you're doing research related to that area. And you also have action research where you want to know what if in terms of teaching and so on. The cross-sectional and longitudinal, we tend to have um, difficulty with those. We look into the design and we can't find them. Our people get mixed up with the different um, longitudinal studies. So a cross-section at a point in time, a type of observation that analyzes data from a population at a specific point in time. Then when it comes to uh, longitudinal, we have panel study and we have longitudinal studies. Now, longitudinal studies, I could be looking at the cohort of students at Elsam High School, grade 12. No, we have a different cohort every year, but that's the longitudinal. I'm looking at that particular characteristic feature of Elsa High School, the, the grade 12. No, it doesn't mean I'm looking at the same grade 12 five years in a row. If I'm doing that, then I'm following that grade 12 to grade 13, then to university, that would be a panel study. The intended use of research, basic or fundamental research, applied re action research. Most of you, if you go into the math and education, or even if you do education, bachelor, you would tell about action research, a type of investigation research designed for use by teachers in an attempt to solve problems and improve professional practices in their own classroom. So they call it action research. Teachers are always engaged in action research as teachers are continually observing students, collecting data, and analyzing to improve students' learning and classroom management. So that's the one that most they would be hearing about for the first time. Action research, applied research, of course, practical in a particular era, and then we speak about basic research. Exploratory, descriptive, explanatory, they speak for themselves, you can read them. Quantitative study, we look at the research design, the sampling plan, method of measuring variables and collecting data, study procedure, including procedures to protect, participant and analytical method and procedures. This is where we do statistical analysis most of the time because given the nature of the data and where we are now, we, we have a number of statistical analysis that we can be used. Chi-square, hypothesis testing, Cronbach alpha. There's the basic one in terms of frequency table, pie chart, bar chart. Sampling of approach, setting and context, and uh, uh, qualitative notice, setting and context. Because very important here, the setting and the context. Who are you asking the question? Are they able to explain anything further with respect to the question? So you're asking about the second teachers, depression, and so on and so forth. Within what context? Are these teachers who, who normally have a good 
track record of coming to school every day pre-COVID-19? Would the teacher have had other medical and medical problem before COVID-19? So we can look at their COVID-19 in that setting. Data collection approaches, study program procedure, and, and allocal strategies. Because here we are doing qualitative, we want to know deep down what is happening and what the respondents have to say. Not just them filling out a question and, and going home. Because we want to find out are there differences in how they feel? Are there differences in how they think? Are there differences in how they and in their perspective on the issue at hand, on the variables, and so on? And so we put here the types of qualitative studies, ethnography, understanding the goals, culture, scenes, and challenges that emerge in the research. And so here we also input the turn it down to grassroots level. Is it affecting Indians as the same as black? And so those are the called ethnographic study. Narrative. This combines a sequence of events, usually from the interview with just a few people. Here you are really giving us a narrative. And one of the students in the school, when asked about family arrangement, um, she said she has no idea what I'm talking about because she don't live with her family. She has never known her family. She grew up being a ward of the state, and so she don't know what you're talking about, her family. These are sick narrative description. Now analogy, using different methods understand the meaning participant plays on whatever is being studied or, or researched. How do they view COVID-19? What do they think COVID-19 is? How much do they know about COVID-19? And so that's the phenomenological. The grounded theory, here you're using the theory to ground your work. Seek to provide an explanation of theory behind events in the research, usually involve large samples. What theory are you applying to the behavior of the teachers with respect to pressure? And which theory are you using? Because there are a lot of theory about depression online. You don't have to reinvent your own. You could go online and you'll find a number of models of depression um, online. Case studies, and this involves a deep understanding through multiple types of data resources. You could do a case study at Eltham. You could do a case study at Immaculate. You could do a, a case study at, at, at Holland High, at Godfrey Strat. You could do a case study at Olaba High. Any questions? I'm asking if you would recommend using the mix method for any type of research, as in if you think it takes too much, it's too much to put together, if it would be ideal for, for this type of um, SDA. I, I don't know if, if you came in late. Uh, the student had asked earlier what I said was that depending on your research, but I caution you, if you're doing a mixed method, mean you're doing a quantitative mixed with a qualitative, you are giving yourself twice the work to begin with, but I hope that you get it right. You can do one and drop off one. So when you're doing discussion, I get discussion on the quantitative, but not on the qualitative. Uh, I get analysis on the quantitative, but not on the qualitative. So you are free to use both, but I'm just cautioning you that where you go for both of them, you are giving yourself twice as much work. Yes, sir. I'm just asking because um, of my sample. Qualitative wouldn't be ideal to start off with because right. I don't know the amount of persons in my sample that are affected by it. To yep. start off with the with the quantitative to find out who and how it affected them, and then I can go into the qualitative to get a better explanation on how this affected them. You can go straight qualitative because you decide the sample. Let's say you're doing HIV because you'd use a snowball sampling for HIV. So you, you go to a spot and you know, this person have HIV, you ask the person, can you say who you have had sex with? Even before you know you had HIV, before you knew your HIV status. So you check those two persons and you ask them, have you done your HIV test? Who have you had sex with? That two point to about six. You go to those six and say, who have you had sex with? That six point to 20. And so you end up with a huge snowball sampling. In that case now, you can choose to go quantitative see, because that's what you have. Or you could also say it mixed because you're going to spend time talking about the people you spoke to, about their HIV status. Some cried, some thought it was a death sentence, some said that the person knew and delivered to give them the HIV and all the manner. So it would give a complete research, but I'm saying that you make the choice. Any other question from anyone else? So they asked for a social perspective. 
And so with social health perspective can best be applied to explain facets of your research, the functionalist, the Marxist, the, the Marxist conflict, Weber social action, interactionist or feminist. Again, you'd have to know these. I guess by now you would have completed them in the semester that is ending. So you'd have to look at the functionalist and the functionalist and Marxist, both of them are macro-social theorists, for them, it is society that influences the behavior of the individual, whereas the, the Weberian and the interactionists look at the individual and how they make sense of the world around them. And whereas the feminists now look at it from a feminine point of view, that with everything to do with women and how women are exploited, how women um, grow up in a patriarchal society, and so on and so forth. So sometimes more than one social perspective can be applied to your research. You could say, yes, I could see Marxist conflict, and I could also see a feminist perspective in terms of how women are treated and so on and so forth. Our interactionist, yes. interactionist perspective, we are looking, when people interact, they make sense of their interaction and they use symbols to interact. So we talk about symbolic interactionism and what those symbols mean. Go ahead, Carnelo. With the feminism and the and the Marxism, they kind of compare together, sir, because with the feminism is talking about female gender in which all female was treated in the past about what the 14th century. So I just saying, in where they kind of see that male kind of have more the capitalism in those days, sir. Well, I think we have more capitalism now. But for the Marxist conflict and the feminist, remember, we also have one of the things I have on the note, which I have sent to ICS for the next workshop. We also have Marxist feminists who believe that capitalism is relegate women to housework so that they can pay men very little. We also have radical feminists and we also have functionalist feminists. So whichever two, but you can link and compare the two. Marxism is broader than Marxist feminist view of society because they are looking at the exploitation of capitalist society and how it disproportionately affects women more than men. Women are paid less. Women don't make it to the top of capitalist organization as easy as men because women have other issues. So which is why the feminist perspective, not as broad as the Marxist conflict, um, but we also have Marxist feminists. So, so what I do say about like the cheat difference, so like for example, from from the Marxism, we uh, we could have seen uh, from the plantation something there, something sorry, from the so we uh, could have seen that mostly female it has directly cheated more we are uh, like the black female because most of them with a probably they in our house are uh, in the in the plantation master house. Working meanwhile, so me that probably they in I feel chopping thing and so on. So, so it kind of kind of have a difference in our way, sir. It was different in that there was a sexual division of labor on the plantation in terms of the work done by the male, the work done by the female. So we did have a sexual division of uh, of labor from plantation society, and that sexual division of labor carried into modern society, in even to postmodern society. But there is a tendency you now to break out of the stereotypical male job versus female job. We still have it, you know, if I said to you, this evening students I have along with me an engineer who is going to talk to you about um, your SBA. Who do you think that engineer will be, male or female? A female. Because in today's society, sir, you kind of see female kind of have dominate male job also, a yeah, male technical um, role. You may want a few. Majority of the students in earshot of my voice would be a male because mm -hmm. when you speak of an engineer, you tend to speak of a male. But what we have now is that some of the best engineers that are, are cropping up um, all around the world are female. So, but what I'm saying, to break out of the patriarchal society, we think that men do science, women do art. Although there are women now who have made strides in the field of science, but I'm saying that generally the thinking is but we are seeing that changing, thank God, as we see more gender equity in society. All right, selection of sample group or cases to be studied. Very important that your sample and the type of sample frame that you choose is important. So the statement providing details of the sample group 
or cases selected and the rationale for your selection. So sample selection procedures are appropriate and reason for choice of technique are valid. You have to say what it is. Type of sample and explanation for your choice of that sample. So we have convenience sampling. Use when the researcher wants volunteer participant to come forward and identify themselves. As in the case of COVID-19, when government want to find out people who were on the airplane. So that's a convenience sampling. So you remember first time and the people came on the plane, the government is saying, please identify yourself so you can come and be COVID tested. We can do the contract tracing, who was the taxi man who carried you, how many people came in the vehicle, since you've been in the district, all the people you've been in contact with, that is a convenience sampling. I spoke about snowball sampling earlier, especially with respect to HIV, uh, who you had sex with, who that person had sex with, how many people, who those other people have sex with, and so your sample keeps getting larger and larger and larger. Purpose is sampling. Participants are cases that will best contribute to the study. So is a reason why you choose these persons. So for example, you're looking at the issue of breast cancer among men. Now, where the men do get breast cancer is a small proportion. So if you check all of them catch you, you may find five. So therefore, those become your sample. So that would be your purposive sample. Somebody said, sir, go ahead, Carnilla. Okay, so I was just asking. I know you repeated it. I know you explained it earlier, but um, I just wanted to like say it in my own version. Like snowball sampling is like um you collect more and more information. I, mean, I remember you made a reference to a snowball going up a hill. Right. So, um, so, so that you collect more and more information, no? but can you collect perhaps collect the same information from each person, but your sample gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Your sample. So you may start with one person by the time you finish, your sample have 40 people in it. But you collect you could be collecting the same information and the, from the party people. Okay, so understood. All right, so so for example, like if I'm going to research about a person or a teenager in Elta my school with obesity, sir, so we can probably look on that person more, sir, or give like a feedback or so on, what I get from it then. Yeah, but what happens is that with obesity? It's less than that there are about five or eight people in Elsam that is obese. You could use them as your purpose of sampling, and not one, not them, not one alone, of course. But it depends on how you define obesity in terms of body mass index, what operationalized, what conceptualization you have for obesity. But certainly, can be one person. Can be purpose purposive in that in the entire Elsam, you perhaps only have eight students that are considered obese, so they become your sample for it. So we also have systematic sampling. Now, most of you will you would we perhaps apply that stratified random sampling, but systematic sampling, this is where the elements in the sample are counted and every case element is saying. When I say case, it could be the second, the third, the twentieth, the tenth, but you are saying that, okay, one, two, three, four, or uh, five. I take the fifth one. One, two, three, four, I take the fifth one again. So every five is selected into your sample. So that is systematic. You are saying you are deciding what K is, whether it's every second, every third, every fifth, every tenth, um, you are deciding what this case element is. Then stratified random sampling is the most popular type of sampling because it involves the division of the research population into smaller subgroups known as strata. Each subgroup or stratum has different characteristics, such as example, income or education attainment. So for example, I remember a student doing a research recently. I don't remember if it was Arden or Elsa or Casey that I'm associated with on the impact of, of reggae music in causing behavioral problems in the school as measured by detention, syndrome for your parents and so on. And so the student came with a sample frame that involved just a six farm people. So I said, oh, you're only doing it among six farm. He said, no, for the whole school. So I said, but if you're doing it in the whole school, I must have a representative from first farm, grade seven, one from grade eight. I mean, so, so, some from grade eight, some from grade nine, some from grade 10, from grade 11, grade 12, and grade 13. And it must be in the proportion of people in your sample. So if you have 10 people in the sample, and say, tw let's say 12, 13, 14, two from, from first farm, the grade seven, grade eight, but you must take the proportion that they are in the population. So if grade one, have a large percentage of individuals than sixth form, then your grade seven, uh, the, the sample from your grade seven 
must be larger than the family from your grade six because it must be representative of the population. And with the population, the first form, the grade seven, at Elsam, uh, as in 240 people. The sixth form only having 60 people. So therefore, I would expect to see more first farmer in your sample than six farmer. That's when you use stratified random sampling. So we must see the strata. We have male and female. So it must also represent the proportion of male and females in the school. Because Eltham has both female and male students. Um, do we only have Afro-Jamaican? Do we have Indo-Jamaican, Indian? And do we have any Syrian or Jews, as the case may be? Is there any other strata in the school? Because we also have lower school and upper school. And we also have people from inner city, people from outer city. So where do we have them? And so that's why we have stratified random sampling. So random sampling thing from each stratum in a number that is proportional to the size of that stratum. Yes, sir. I mean, that's a fair example with that, sir. Suppose, like, you're looking at a research about all female getting high grade more than male in St. Jerry's High School, sir. So you kind of go do a research and, and a research design finding your data about it. In the end, you probably see that male kind of have more grade higher than female. So that probably could have been a change. But for example, then they probably say that female get higher than male. So, but from doing the research, you kind of see that, kind of see that you kind of have a change related to that, sir. So that could have been a point for this one, sir. Let me see if I get it so I can understand it clearly. They are doing a gender research whether females in St. Jacob High School have better academic performance than males. Here it is now you have male and female, but you still have a other strata that are important. Is it just in sixth farm, in fifth farm, in third farm, in fourth farm, at grade 10, 9, 7? Where? Because, and if you're looking at the entire school, then obviously your strata must consist of grade 7, grade 8, grade 9, grade 10, grade 11, grade 12, grade 13. And so I'm saying that although you're looking at male and female, but you must also look at the different stratum that are in your sample. Follow me? Your sample must reflect the population of the school. So you can't just say, I'm just looking, um, if you're saying you're doing that St. Diego, then you can't just look at fifth farmers at St. Diego. Uh, if you're doing it only at fifth farm, then fine. Go and so that with us fifth farmers in your research statement, you must state with fifth farmers at St. Diego High School. But if you're doing that St. Diego, you must look at the different strata um, with respect to student at St. Diego, male and female, for, um, grade, uh, grade 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and so on and so forth. Okay, sir. So then we have cluster sampling, similar to stratified random, but divide the population into what we call clusters geographically. We do that generally for politics. Data collection, a description of the instrument or techniques used to collect the data. Most of the time, most of will do a survey. So we use a questionnaire. You can collect data from interviews, questionnaires, and surveys, observations, documents, and records. You could use secondary sources. For example, you're looking at academic performance. You use secondary sources. The school have record of the student performance from first form up. You could use focus group, and you could use oral history. What have been said in the past, or what has been done in the past. Krista Strutt, your hand is up. Go ahead. Excuse me, sir. I'm asking if for social interviews, I don't know with the whole COVID thing, you aren't able to meet with people, if Zoom would be accepted, like if you were supposed to have Zoom sessions. Or you could use that thing we call monkey survey, where if you know people like people in school, where you do it in a school, you advise the students to go online and do the monkey survey and upload it. So that way you have all of them. We really guard against you going to face people to do a questionnaire. Of course, we know that self administered question is better. When you go, you ask the question because you can give clarification. Well, what you can do in this case, you can use Zoom. So if you send the questionnaires to a group of people, let's say you send it to a group of people within first uh, grade seven, grade nine, grade 12, as the case may be, then you send each of them the Zoom link and then you said, okay, question one, they might ask you what exactly, you mean by, tell them they're filling it out, question two, question three. So you could use a Zoom link because we do caution against you going to a face-to-face -face interaction to fill out a questionnaire. Okay, thank you. Also for the questionnaires, Google Forms can be used. I see I see the survey that you guys just tell me about, which I can add to my list. Sometimes the problem with Google Forms is that it doesn't capture exactly what you said in your research statement, what you said that you're looking at, what you gave the rationale for, what you say was your research question, because these are just general 
not necessarily along the line that you are looking at it from. Also, your sample frame is different. Elsa my high school is different from, from an high school in the States, from a high school in Britain. And so there are cultural factors that are different. And so you can apply wholesale, the Google form, to your questionnaire. So this is very important, your data collection method, because herein lies the heart of your research. This is where you get the data that you're going to analyze, that you're eventually going to show in your discussion, and that you're going to discuss and analyze. So if you're running a problem with your data collection, and which is why I say to students, be certain to choose the search that you can carry out. There are students who choose the search, and then when time comes for the SBA to end in, they said, the organization said, no, I can't, I can't interview them workers. And you're finding out two days before it's due to tell the teacher, no. So make sure you do research where you'll be allowed to find out first, if you'll be allowed to conduct the research, and if you have access to the respondents. And remember, when it comes to children, children are special case, just like females, just like people in prison, people in hospital, you have to get permission. You have to get permission to survey those individuals. Good night. I wanted to ask, suppose you're doing a interview. I was asking if you have any tips on how to like conduct an interview knowing that it's COVID time now? Well, as the person said earlier, you may want to use Zoom. And so prepare your question. Your questionnaire is an instrument of measure. So if you're using questionnaire, it must be consistent with the variable that you're measuring. That's what we talk about internal consistency. To what extent your questionnaire is consistent with the variable that you are measuring. For interview, you would prepare your interview questions before. If you're doing interviews as opposed to questionnaire, you prepare your interview questions, but also your interview questions must reflect what you are trying to measure. So your question must be aimed at getting information on what you are measuring. Your question should ask about one thing and one thing only. Don't ask people, do you smoke and drink? What if I smoke but don't drink? I drink but don't smoke. What do I answer you? Your question, your question should be about one thing only. Do not ask the respondent question that they are not in a position to answer. And you're going to ask a particular student, Jamie Lawrence, do you think all the students in the school are fathers that don't live at home? In live everybody's house? How am I going to know that? No. So you don't ask the respondent question that the respondent is not in a position to answer. Uh, uh, for example, you ask the, the teacher, do you think the principal believe that teachers are calling school? She not in the, the principal head. She don't know what the principal think. So you can ask about she, her. You ask the principal about how he views the entire school. You can ask him that. But you can ask a teacher about what the principal think or what other teachers think. So you should ask a question that the respondent can answer. Avoid double barred question. I said that before where you ask about two things in the one question, whether you gamble and smoke, whether you drink and smoke, whether you're absent because you're sick or absent because you, you think you haven't used up your, your sick leave yet and all days won't come. You ask one. You want to avoid too many open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are those questions. For example, you're saying, list the different ways in which you're affected by COVID-19. I tell you, you may get one questionnaire with 20 different ways. You may get another with 15 different ways. You may get another with 35 different ways. All of those have to be included in your analysis. If you are using SPSS, you have to input all of them into your statistical analysis, all of them. So if one of the open responses of 20 responses, you have to input all 20. That's why we say to students, avoid as much as possible open-ended questions is when you try to input that data and to make sense of it, because with each open-ended question could come 20 different responses. Means if it's 20 questions and you have 10 open-ended questions, each of the 10 can give up 15 or 20 different responses. That will make it 400 or 200 responses that you have to input into SPSS. That's why we say to you avoid open-ended questions. I know they give a deep discussion. I suggest to people, if you are doing qualitative, do narratives. 
what did the people say? Tape them, what did they say, and so on. Because once you leave it open-ended, you have a lot of data to contend with. Because you have 20 questions on the questionnaire, eight of them are open-ended, and each open-ended have 20 responses are 10 or 15. Just try and multiply in your head the amount of things you have to engage with in your discussion and analysis. Any question? We have a question. Chat, what is the minimum amount of persons that we should use to complete the SBA? Well, as I said, if it's quantitative, quantitative requires between 25 and 30. Minimum. But if you're doing a qualitative, up to 10 is fine for qualitative. But remember, qualitative requires deeper description. Sir? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. When you were speaking of narrative, I know from my questions, um, I was asking them on their personal experience with psychosocial issues, having based that I would have explained two of the issues that they may have and explain if they do have an experience with it. Would that be more of a narrative? I don't really understand um, the terms. Did, ask, did you tape them? I haven't completed the interview yet. No, so what I'm saying, so you wouldn't have the narrative. Because you're going to go back home and then try and remember what they said. Narrative is that narrative, exactly what they said. Mm -hmm. You follow me? You can write it afterwards, you know, because you can remember and write it immediately afterwards, fine. But the main thing you do with narrative is that you tape them. You ask their permission, so you're not going to call their name, but yeah. you are interested in what they have to say. And so you are going to tape them so you can quote them verbatim, how they feel about the variable how they feel about the intervention, how they feel about whatever it is. And so when you tape them, you can then listen to the tape and write down their narrative. You're not going to use all of them in the research, but the most poignant ones, the ones them that, are, that jump out at you, relate to the search. So um, this particular respondent indicated how the terrible impact of the pandemic on her psychosocial life. She stated that she had lost her grandmother, she had lost her mother, her husband was hospitalized for 10 days. That is sick description. That is tell people the impact it has on some people. And so that's a narrative. But yes. you would have taped her in order for you to, to include it in your narrative discussion. I'll give you some, some examples here, which in terms of the type of description that you can use a pie chart so you have uh, you can do a pie chart most of the computer software can can give you a pie chart you put in the data and so on and you can tell from the pie chart so grade seven and five percent english passes math this could be grade eight the passes in english fall and um, passes in, in maths increase social so they increase and the it remain the same at grade nine we start to look at improvement in the English and the maths, the social studies begin to fall, and perhaps because they're spending more time studying the math, and the IT also increases. Then now, by the time grade 10, we can say that their English passes have increases, but their maths passes also increase marginally, where their social studies have gone right back up, and they also have increased their IT, because there tend to be a correlation between increase in IT and increase in maths passes. English passes, again, at 80% when they are at CSEC level now, 74% in math, 98%. So uh, this is a graph in which both variables move in the same direction. So we said that this is a correlation graph, that there is a direct correlation between a COVID-19 academic performance that this graph reflects. They're moving in the same direction from one end to the next end. That's an inverse graph. But you could have a bar chart that should show different bars for different things, categories. So this could be from grade 11, grade 10, grade 8, and you're looking at passes in maths. And so category 2, grade 7 and 8 and 9, as the case may be. These are things that you should know at the grade 12 level. What do you mean by mean? What do you mean by median? And so I give examples here, just to refresh your memory. How we come by a frequency table, we tally, and then we, we show the frequency. This now can be plotted against whichever variable you want. You can contact the ICS for these notes. Any question that you have? Sir, so I was wondering if the hypothesis is needed for the IA. Again, depends on your type of research. You can have it for quantitative and you can have it for qualitative research. So it depends on what you're doing. Sir. Yes, sir. I 
I I was wondering if I could use like the objective that I have and use it for my literature review. But you must use objective for literature review. That is, it is from your objective that you can look for the literature. So mm -hmm. what? So, so you look at what are your objectives, and so um, it talks about you looking at the correlation between A and B. So you you look up literature for A and B if you can find or A and literature and B and so on. So it must be tied to it. Because why else would you be doing a literature review? So you can explain the conclusion first. What you arrive at when you did your research? What did it show? Because that will be what you're concluding that there is a correlation between A and B, or no correlation exists, or there's an inverse correlation when one increase and the next one decrease. So it depends on what you find that to be in your conclusion. Hello, before you leave, good evening, everyone. We have come to the end of our first Cape Sociology Workshop. My name is Bettine Ross Laws. I am the coordinator for this workshop and I am also the Senior Administrative Assistant at the Institute of Caribbean Studies. So before we close, I just want to thank you for participating in the Cape Sociology Workshop. Special thanks to Dr. Sonia Standenayer, Director of the Institute of Caribbean Studies, Dr. Nicole Plummer, Associate Dean, Marketing and Outreach, and a lecturer at the Institute of Caribbean Studies. Dr. Orville Beckford, we thank you so much for delivering this workshop. You have done well as per usual. Miss Isabel Dennis, ICS Tech Support, we thank you so much for your usual assistance. Miss Kadian Williams, she is the assistant coordinator for this workshop. And thanks to all the persons on the planning committee for these workshops, students and teachers from both locally and regionally. We thank you so much for participating. And we hope that this workshop was beneficial and the knowledge gained will assist you in successfully completing this course. Please be reminded that we will be hosting workshops for CSEC Social Studies on Wednesday, that's tomorrow, December 9th, and Cape Caribbean Studies Workshop on Thursday, December 10th. These workshops will commence at 3.30 p.m. and expected to end at about 5.30 p.m. The ICS is committed to serve you. We will be hosting online marathons in 2021 and as you were told by Dr. Beckford, we will be having another sociology workshop, hopefully in January, but we will provide further information about same in short order. And then we look at unit one and our vision of all the areas in unit one in the syllabus. So please feel free to visit our YouTube channel. We will provide that information in the chat for previous recording of CAPE workshops and other information about the Institute of Caribbean Studies. For additional information about the Institute of Caribbean Studies and our program offerings, please contact us at 876-977-1951. You can also reach us via WhatsApp at 876-775-0521. Eight, eight. Thank you again for participating in this workshop and have a wonderful evening. And thank you students as well from me. Thank you for your participation. Really enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Williams. I think he's a teacher. Yugunando Williams. Thanks again, everybody. Have a good evening.